Ottawa. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, September 22nd. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now under a rainfall warning, it's 17 degrees in Ottawa and in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. The verdict coming very shortly for former OC Transpo bus driver, charging connection with the fatal bus crash at Westboro Station about two and a half years ago. That's being announced this morning. Here's Chris Curry's. The 44-year-old was behind the wheel of a double-decker city bus that crashed into a bus shelter at Westboro Station in January of 2019. The crash took the lives of three people, Bruce Tomlinson, Judy Booth, and Anya Van Beek, and injured 23 others. Asa Diallo was charged back in August of 2019 following an eight-month investigation that resulted in three counts of dangerous driving causing death and 35 charges of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. Diallo pleaded not guilty to those charges. A verdict will come down at the Elgin Street Courthouse at 9.15 this morning. Chris Curry's City News. City News time, 9.01. Hydro Ottawa experiencing a power outage around the Somerset Bay, McLeod, Kent and Lyon area. The cause of the outage is under investigation right now. Now, Hydro Ottawa estimates the power should be back around 10 o'clock this morning for some 3,400 or so customers affected. There are some traffic lights out in the area, so if you come across lights not working, remember that is now an all-way stop. And now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Rainfall warning now in effect for Ottawa and the Valley. Our high 20 degrees today will have the periods of rain at times heavy. More rain for us tonight, 17 for the low. Some areas could end up with significant amounts of rain over the next several days. For today, the high 20 And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 17 degrees. The disabled train on the track just west of Tremblay Station has been cleared to be moved by the Transportation Safety Board. It can be moved to the maintenance shed now. The on-scene investigation into Sunday's derailment complete. Now, this is the latest in a series of problems spanning two years since the light rail system launched. A candidate for mayor in next year's civic election says it's time for the city to pull the plug on a 30-year contract to maintain that fleet. Bob Shirelli, who plans to run for mayor in Ottawa next fall, says it's time for council to use the escape clause or any other method available to get out of the contract with Rideau Transit Group. Shirelli says the city should wash its hands of that 30-year maintenance deal. He is going to be on the Rob Snow Show very shortly. Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson says he will be pushing to make transit city uh, transit free for all riders through the month of December. He and the transit chair, Alan Hubley, will be putting forward a motion at today's council meeting. That gets underway shortly. Watson says the money needed to cover a month of service at no charge to you would come from funds that would have been sent to Rideau Transit Group. The city has the power under its contract to withhold funding if a certain level of service is not met. City News Time 903, the Ottawa Student Transportation Authority updating the severe bus driver shortage this morning at 11 o'clock. The OSTA General Manager Vicky Kiriakou will make a statement then. Now, the shortage this year is causing transportation problem for students in both the public and the Catholic boards. The authority says it continues to work with drivers as well as OC Transpo to find creative solutions to the shortage and provide service to as many students as possible. And Ontario's new COVID-19 vaccine certificate system is in effect today. If you want to do things like dine in at a restaurant or go to a nightclub, you must show that proof. The Premier will be addressing the media this morning at 11.30. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Separating headlines... From hearsay. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. On the first day of fall. Yeah, that's it. Official now. Summer 2021. All over. 90 days until the first day of winter. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Will the light rail be ready? Good morning. 
Welcome to the Rob Snow Show. On City News, we are jam-packed, wide open, pedal to the metal between now and noon because it's a big day in the news business, particularly in local news. Light rail, big story. Public transit in general, massive story right now. We're all over it today. There's a city council meeting today. Our friends at Rogers Television will leave the Rob Snow Show, carry your city council meeting for you when it begins. It, it, it hasn't officially been on the agenda, but it's been telegraphed. It's going to come up, the problems with light rail. Many, 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 many problems with Ottawa's light rail system. The mayor, Jim Watson, along with the chair of the Transit Commission, Councillor Alan Hubley, they're going to move a motion guaranteed to pass, as you heard in our newscast, to offer transit riders uh, free trips during the month of December. That's the gimmicky giveaway, the gimmicky goodie. That is the olive branch to the poor hard done by transit rider. That's uh, their compensation, I guess you could say, for having to endure all of these many issues with light rail. The latest, of course, being derailments. And as it turns out, there's a lot more to that story than we heard during the Transit Commission meeting, which was just this past Monday. I, I I heard these details yesterday on City News. I, I read the news reports. I mean, it's hard to believe that this can even happen. I mean, these trains are what? They're supposed to have the new train smell. They're only two years old. And yet on a bright, sunny Sunday, one of them comes off the tracks. Okay, not only it, it, uh, off the tracks, it... I mean, I'm trying to picture this. Brand new train. State of the art, right? State of the art. It it pulls into a light rail station. It it leaves the light rail station. It's off the tracks. Wheels are off the tracks. Off the tracks as it is crossing a rail bridge over one of the busiest roads in the city, Riverside Drive. Just what the heck is going on here? $2 billion light rail system, seven years in the making. So you can bet we're going to get into this in a big, big way, explore some of the city's options. And we will be listening into the city council meeting when this matter comes up, this month's worth of free transit. A month's worth of free transit! The city, meaning you, John Q, Jane Q, taxpayer, you pay RTM, RTG, whatever it's called these days, $5 million a month to maintain the light rail system. $5 million a month. And you can't even take the train today. And people won't be able to take the train for weeks to come. Instead, and you see it on social media, people being crowded onto buses now. Again, again, like cattle. COVID cattle. Crowded onto buses. Packed buses during the fourth wave of COVID. Disaster. Embarrassment. And not ending anytime soon. I mean, look around the city. We just keep building more of it. Doubling down, tripling down on a train system. Come on, if you're honest with yourself, it hasn't really worked. Since its launch, has it? Really? No. So, yeah, I want to get into that during the talk back hour as well this morning. We're going hardcore local news on the talk back hour this morning. Um, we do it every morning between 10 and 11 o'clock. It's an hour of phone calls. It's an hour of opinions. Hottest hour of talk radio in town. When it comes to light rail, what are we supposed to do now? What do you do now? Phase one is, is, is not even operational today. Phase two construction, look around the city, the impact that's having on the city, right? It's well underway.
And phase three, the federal politicians during the most recent federal election campaign just tripping all over themselves to give the city more money, more money, more money. Go build more light rail, more light rail. But I mean, the, 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 we're so far gone into this now. We can't tear up the tracks and fill in the tunnel with cement. Phase two, we're so far into that that you know, there's no turning back on that now. So I am making an appeal to you, the listeners of the Rob Snow Show. Please give me some ideas. All right, because I'm at a loss. I don't know what we can do now. What should we do? I'm going to ask Bob Shirelli about this. He's planning a run for mayor. He's going to join me a quarter after nine. Your opinions on this are most welcome during the talkback hour between 10 and 11. At 750-1310. There's some other local issues that I want to get into as well. I want to follow up with you uh, on this revelation this week. You heard it on the Rob Snow Show yesterday. That, And th- this, this is how I am describing it. This is how I described it in my Snow and 60 commentary this morning on Shea 106. We have unofficially decriminalized all illegal drugs in the city of Ottawa. Did you know that? Were you consulted on that? Did you know that that's now the policy of the Ottawa Board of Health? Did you know that it has the support of the Ottawa Police Service? One of the top people from the Ottawa Police Service will be on our show tomorrow morning. But they've, they've, they've basically gone and done it. The laws haven't changed, but the city's kind of going its own way. And decriminalizing the simple possession of all illegal drugs. Possession, okay? Not drug dealing or drug trafficking, but simple possession of all illegal street drugs. And I just want to know what you think about it. I don't think there's been much public discussion about it. I certainly think there should be. Do you think that that is a step in the right direction or the wrong direction for the city of Ottawa? to decriminalize all illegal drugs, possession of all illegal drugs. And I want to get your take on what what the city should do with the vacancy on the council now um, because of the situation in Canada North where Jenna Suds won the federal race there. That means Canada North needs a new city councillor. I want to know because these are the options. Uh, should city council appoint someone? to be the city councillor, kind of a caretaker councillor until the next municipal election, or should there be a by-election? A year out from the, the big municipal election, should we have a by-election? By-election would cost about a half a million dollars. Those are the choices faced right now. What, what would you pick? We continue to follow the fallout from the federal election, and uh, every Wednesday we score our political fix. Two great political analysts are on our show this morning after the 9.30 news. Gary Keller, Susan Smith. Gary's more on the right side of things. Used to work for a guy named John Baird. Susan's a big liberal. You know that. I watched her on TV on election night. She was on TV on election night. We're going to talk about the uncertain future for a trio of politicians. Aaron O'Toole, Justin Trudeau, and Jason Kenney. And if we have time, we might talk about Doug Ford. Uh, Doug Ford's having a news conference this morning. It was scheduled for 10. It's been moved back to 1130 on this vaccine certificate day. We'll carry some of uh, DOFO's news conference when it starts. So like I said, heck of a day in the news game. And you are in exactly the right place for the news and the views. The Rob Snow Show on City News. Ottawa Markets was created by the City of Ottawa to help uh, rejuvenate the outdoor markets program in Byward and Wellington West where we have the Parkdale Market. And so we've set to work on bringing in the right team with the right experience and reaching out to local vendors and local farmers because we knew when we did a survey of our customers that that was the one thing that was really important to them both at Byward and in Parkdale is to start bringing back that local product. And that's what you can see behind us here at the York Street Farmers Market. We put in place a farmer's first policy, which means that we will deal with farmers from the region, 
first. And we're going to give them priority in terms of placement. They're going to have reduced fees in coming to the market. We've also made it free for any farm that's been in operation for under two years. The market also put in place a BIPOC initiative, which is a Black, Indigenous, and Peoples of Color initiative, which provides grants and support opportunities for folks from those communities to come on out to the market to reduce systemic barriers that have existed. As a farmer's market, we can have a variety of vendors uh, here, from uh, an artisan uh, to a uh, microprocessor who's taking local ingredients and putting them into a, uh, a product in a, in a, a kitchen and selling that, uh, to uh, breweries and distilleries this year, uh, which were changes that the province put in place, which allowed us to bring in a, a few of those vendors as well, which uh, I think is a nice surprise for people sometimes at nine in the morning uh, after a pandemic, but uh, it's been going really well. And uh, uh, you know, some of the breweries have been pretty appreciative because for them, uh, whether it just be doing uh, uh, delivery uh, or curbside pickup, uh, it gives them an opportunity to come back out and, and talk with their customer and, and talk about you know, what makes their product so special. Throughout the market, the health and safety protocols that you're going to see, uh, masks are still required. Uh, that is obviously the, the case, and you'll see a number of signs noting that around the area. We've got a number of hand sanitizer units, I call them droids, throughout the area that you can sort of just uh, grab a pump or a squeeze wherever you go. But what we've also had to do is reduce the number of vendor spaces we have in the market by 50%. This ensures that we can guarantee that our vendors are gonna have that distance, that we can you know, have a little bit better flow around the market. But what we also did was, as I said, we created the uh, York Street Farmers Market, which is just microprocessors and local producers only. And that's on Saturdays. In Parkdale, we launched the night market, which is bringing a lot of the same content, but in the evening. And, and residents are sort of spilling out into the park. So we're looking at what we're doing as trying to support create and enhance public space for the residents of the city. It's been great, you know, the community, it, which is what this market is city here for. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Returns with former regional chair, Ottawa mayor, MPP Bob Shirelli. Good morning, Bob. Uh, good morning. Boy, light rail's a mess, isn't it? It's a real mess, isn't it? Well, um, I'm uh, quite active uh, in the community and uh, what's very clear uh, including, for example, an editorial in the Community Voice newspaper, uh, that there's um, an urgent need to minimize the damage to our city's reputation, to our financial sustainability, to our quality of life indeed, and LRT is weighing the city down. Uh, to be clear, there's no easy solution here. Um, but this is a wake-up call to City Council and senior management at the uh, City of Ottawa, Time has run out. Now is the time, I believe, for some dramatic and real, realistic action. And I think most importantly, council needs to come together. It is too divided. This is too important an issue for the city, for the people of Ottawa, for um, the type of um, uh, animated uh, action we have at uh, city council. They need to come together. That's, that's, uh, that's very, very important. What are some possible courses of action, in your opinion, Bob Shirelli? Well, I think that um, the senior management and, and council uh, need to retain independent legal counsel, a totally independent legal firm, to examine the liability, where the fault is, from a legal perspective. Uh, I think at the same time, they need to retain fully independent technical specialists who can take over from Rideau Transit management, okay, because there's, there's serious, serious uh, problem there. You know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm an old lawyer, and I remember in law school that uh, there's an expression called raise ipsa locator it's a latin expression and it means and it's a principle of law that the thing speaks for itself the court can attribute negligence and show us that you are not negligent so there needs to be a full full analysis of where we're going here and uh it's time it's time for very very urgent action and as i said council needs to come together it is too divided Okay, okay. 
but a fresh set of eyes. It sounds like um, on both the legal front and the technical front, the engineering front, but uh, would be your advice right now. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, when you say council is too divided, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? Give me a, a sense well, of what I you mean. Well, I think there's a general consensus of, uh, of uh, people who follow City, follow City Hall that there's, uh, there's a group of councillors who vote uh, for the mayor, whatever yes. the mayor wants, the mayor gets, yes, and yes. that there's another group of councillors who, who uh, uh, want to be maybe more creative uh, and more responsive to some of the issues that uh, uh, I think they feel left out and uh, not included, right? Uh, and uh, that that is that is very very bad medicine for uh, for any council. So so maybe a better course of action, just say from the from the city council side, would be a united front, a united, a more united front, front, a more united front um, against if, 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 uh, RTM, for example. Yes, yes. Right. I think okay. uh, uh, I think there are serious issues there with RTM. Um, they they're responsible for the uh, for the um, maintenance and the management, and uh, uh, it's clear, uh, as I said, raise ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. Right. Yes. Uh, that yeah. uh, that things uh, are not going well on the maintenance side, and uh, and uh, that has to be dealt with. It can't be. Uh, uh, senior city management or, or, or maybe some people on council saying, well, there's nothing wrong, everything's okay. Right. Uh, that's not the case. Okay. Because okay. Thing, it speaks for itself. It spe- it's okay, so let's, so, so let's keep with this theme. It speaks for itself. The track record over the last two years speaks for itself. Parts flying off of, 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 of trains, poor winter performance, and now two derailments in six weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, okay, let's, let's stick with that, Bob. It speaks for itself. So what, what if the city, even, even its outside lawyers, ad, a, advises, um, yeah, you should get out of this, and here's how you would get out of it, and here's, you know, you're not going to get out of a multi-billion dollar contract without having to pay something, I would assume, Bob Shirelli. Um, then what are the options? Then what do you do? It would seem there are a couple of options. You hire a new private company to maintain the trains, or you bring it in-house and you maintain the trains just the same way we maintain the bus fleet in the city of Ottawa. Yeah. What would be your preferred course of action if you were the mayor? Um, I, I think there needs to be a marriage between uh, a city management uh, and uh, a new technical uh, contract with, with, a, with a new firm uh, to do the management. Uh, they've got to be. They've got to work together as a team. Um, it doesn't appear to be the case right now, uh, so that that has to be rectified. But uh, there's no easy solution here. There's no uh, you know walk into council and uh, move a motion and uh, this is this is how we're going to fix it uh, tomorrow. Right. Uh, th- this is a serious issue, and people have to recognize that uh, it's uh, it's not going to be an easy fix. Well, yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a lawyer's dream, I suspect, Bob. Um, you know, yeah, and, and a politician's nightmare. You know, big bucks, big bucks involved in this contract. You know what? You know what it's like. They hit reset buttons on North South Light Rail. It costs money to get out of that as well. So yes, yes. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but it wasn't it wasn't cheap. Um, the the mayor and the transit com- uh, commission chair councillor Hubley there said, well um, we'll move a motion a month's worth of free transit I call it a gimmick uh, that's a gimmick uh, what do you think Bob well given given the the pressures that that are are arising in council and indeed in the media uh, I think that uh, that uh, the uh, the realities the realities have to be dealt with uh, moving forward. Okay, what do you mean by that? I mean that they've they've got to they've got to admit that this thing is not working. Right, right, right. And right. they've got to come up with a solution okay. that is uh, that's very uh, realistic. And uh, as I said, that there's there's not going to be an easy solution here. Okay, I want to ask you if, about a few other things outside of light rail because there's been a lot happening, as as you know. Um, your old uh, caucus colleague at Queen's Park, Yasser Nakfi, won in Ottawa Centre on election night. Um, yes. I know you congratulated him on Twitter. 
Uh, I've known him for quite some time as well. Um, he was 12 years in MPP. Do you think he would be well suited as kind of the the regional minister for this area, Bob Shirley? What do you think? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, I think that there are a number of uh, of uh, current MPs in the area who can serve as a regional minister. Yasser is certainly one of them. Okay. Um, but we know that uh, that uh, the prime minister uh, likes to have balance. Yes. So uh, he, I'm guessing that he'll he'll have one one uh, a woman uh, and uh, somebody else. I mean, you've got David McGinty, who's been there for uh, for a long time. He's uh, a wealth of experience, particularly in the environmental area. Uh, very responsible. Uh, and you've got Yasser, who's just coming in. He has a lot of provincial experience. Uh, there's a difference between uh, being in a provincial government and being in the federal government. Uh, and uh, Yasser would have to uh, accommodate that. Right. But uh, so so I I, uh, I I think it's not a given, but I think that uh, Yasser certainly would be in the running for that. Okay. Uh, Jenna Suds, uh, it, it appears as though she is one in Canada Carleton, so that uh, creates a vacancy. I'm not sure in your time um, as either regional chair or mayor, if you've been in this position where you've had to face this decision, okay, do we have a by-election to fill a vacancy? Do we leave the seat vacant? Do we appoint someone? But uh, it's less than a year to go before the municipal election. Should we really spend a half a million dollars on a by-election to fill a vacant council seat? What, what, what do you think? Well, first of all, I, I, fortunately, I didn't have that dilemma okay, <laughs> uh, over okay. uh, a significant period of time. Right, right. Um, and uh, again, this is this is a decision for council. Uh, this is this is uh, this is where council should come together and decide uh, what, where we should be going with this. Mm-hmm. My my sense is. But if you were the mayor, you're the leader of council. You're the boss. You know. You, you know. You rep- You speak. For the whole city. So what yeah, would you but do? I never yeah. tried to be a dictator. Okay, I always right. I always accommodated uh, the the wishes of uh, consensus on council, and uh, work closely with uh, councillors individually. So, uh, but I think at this particular uh, point in time, uh, given the LRT uh, challenges uh, and a few others, that uh, they should try to find somebody with experience who can can go in and. Uh, uh, be be part of the solution from day one. Um, so uh, I think they should uh, they should search for uh, somebody that has good experience. Right. So maybe somebody uh, like Marianne Wilkinson or somebody uh, who's kind perhaps, of been there perhaps, before. Perhaps uh, there, there, there are a number of uh, people right. who could do it. Right. Uh, there could be uh, people who have been uh, federal elected or uh, mm-hmm. provincially elected who might be able to uh, fill in. But I think there's need for for uh, a sense of wisdom and experience uh, on uh, on a new council position. Okay. Hey, thank you, Bob Shirelli. Good to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. bye-bye now. Yeah. Former regional chair, mayor, and MPP, and he plans to be a candidate in the mayor's race next year. That's Bob Shirelli. We're back with your political fix right after the news. City News.
number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, September 22nd. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now, under a rainfall warning, it's 19 degrees in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news this hour. Sentencing for Asatu Diallo is just getting underway at the Elgin Street Courthouse. She is charged with 38 counts of dangerous driving, three of them causing death in the Westboro double-decker bus crash in January of 2019. Stay with City News. We'll bring you that verdict as soon as it is delivered. Candidate for Mayor of Ottawa, Bob Shirelli, says Ottawa Council needs to come together, forget their divisions, and deal with a very important issue, light rail. Shirelli says council must take real and drastic action. He says there is no easy solution to problems encountered on the LRT line over the two years since its inception. Premier Ford will be in front of a microphone for the first time in weeks now. He'll address the COVID situation and a new requirement for people to show proof of vaccine to get into certain businesses. That came into effect today. He'll be at the podium at Queen's Park this morning at 11.30. We're also going to get an update this morning on the situation with school busing in Ottawa. Critical shortage of drivers left some parents to scramble to get their kids back and forth to school every day. And the Transportation Authority says it is working on creative solutions with its staff and OC Transpo to get as many uh, school-aged children back and forth as possible. City News Time 932, I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time to score your political fix. And joining us this morning, Susan Smith, principal at Blue Sky Strategy Group. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Rob. Hey, I saw you on TV election night. I was trying <laughs> I was to go to bed early. Night. I was trying to go to bed early. Uh, 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 you were on CPAC with uh, Kate Harrison. Uh, I was watching That's a right. little. I was watching a little bit of that flipping. Flipping, flipping, Did I flipping, have my right? Sleeping bag and pajamas. No, but you didn't have or? that like the trademark Susan Smith glasses on. I, I was like, she's not no. wearing her glasses. I, um, I did the um, next day because my eyes barely opened. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, great, great, great stuff. Great, great analysis right. on election night. And Gary Keller is here, vice president of Strategy Corps. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. Were Rob. you playing Television Star? Did you play Television Star on election night, uh, Gary? Not on election no, night. Uh, but left out, like election. me, Gary. Left <laughs> out. Eh? Yeah, yeah. But uh, a, lot, a lot on the lead up, and it was a late night. You know, when they don't start oh, counting gosh. ballots yeah. until nine thirty, uh, it's uh, it's a late night. Yeah, so. I slept like a rock yesterday. I, w- I was in bed before the sun went down yesterday. So. Yeah, uh, a lot of us. I, I yeah. believe it or not, I know it'll be shocking to listeners. I was so tired I couldn't speak. Last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think productivity for the Canadian economy probably hit a, a, a low y- yesterday, but nevertheless. Around 4 p.m. probably. <laughs> I think uh, the theme for today is walking the plank, okay? And who will be walking the plank after this election? So let's talk about Aaron O'Toole, first of all. I have heard it uh, from my sources within the Conservative Party. There is considerable frustration um, about the way Aaron O'Toole ran this election campaign, first of all. Uh, he, ru- he, he won the leadership as true blue. He, Aaron, the real Aaron O'Toole is not true blue. He's a very shade of red, red Tory. Uh, so I'm hearing things too mushy, liberal light, mishandled the gun issue, could have been better, uh, better handled, should have been ready for it, Misha- totally mishandled the vaccine issue, and then went into hiding in the last week. And uh, there's anger. And there will be knives out for him. What do you think will happen with uh, the leadership of Aaron O'Toole? Is he going anywhere, Gary Keller? Well, first of all, your comment about walking the plank, you know, I think I should invest in plank futures before the day before an election, <laughs> because no matter what happens in an election campaign, there's always going to be talk about somebody having to walk the plank. So uh, maybe I would have been a rich man if I would have done that uh, yeah, yeah. On, uh, on Friday. You before, missed out but, on the big lumber boom already, Gary. Exactly, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But look, looking to the, towards the election, 
Uh, of course, people in the conservative camp are disappointed with the result. Um, and they were expecting, uh, you know, to be very, very close. The polls were very, very close leading up until uh, Election Day. Um, and, you know, of course, people are, un- are always unhappy uh, after the election campaign. I- I'd like to talk to these people uh, the first two weeks of the campaign uh, when, you know, the liberal uh, campaign numbers were collapsing and the conservatives were surging and it looked like Aaron O'Toole might have a path to government. I'm sure these people were like, wow, this this is this, this campaign is a great campaign. Yeah. It's working. It's fantastic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, of yeah. course, hindsight is always is 2020. Yeah, then it was like red carpets instead of planks that we were <laughs> talking about. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and look. Is incumbent on the party to do a review of what what worked well and what didn't work well, and Mr. O'Toole has announced uh, that uh, will be taking place. Um, you know, I did think the last week of the campaign, especially the last three or four days, um, there seemed to be a momentum surge uh, from Mr. Trudeau, who's obviously a great campaigner and kind of, you know, is great out there on the hustings and kind of sees the the last few days where I felt like the conservative campaign was uh, running out of a bit of ga- a bit of gas. But look, the grand bargain that that, that Aaron O'Toole made. Well, it was not only about- that it was out of gas, Gary. They they like they parked the campaign bus in the garage and didn't take it anywhere. I mean, literally, the guy was ducking everybody. The grand bargain that Aaron O'Toole made uh, was that. We are willing to move our, our party to the center to be a bigger tent, and we may lose some votes in those those ridings where we racked up massive majorities in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, yeah. and we're going to try to win those uh, votes in Ontario and Quebec and Atlantic Canada. And it looked pretty good on election night when coming out of Atlantic Canada because the Conservatives were up four seats. Um, look, there's going to be a lot of time to unpack all this information yeah, yeah. And, and, this, and this data. Um, it wasn't just the campaign. 59% turnout in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you look at things like vote efficiency. It's still a problem for the, the Conservatives. The Liberals have cornered the market on that and have done a great job at, at figuring out vote efficiency. Um, and so there are many, many factors. It wasn't just, you know, you know, he ran a terrible campaign. You know, of course, it's, people are going to come out of the woodwork and say that post-election. Um, but, yeah, there's obviously time for soul-searching and some data uh, research and and I, I really encourage people to, like, let's take a deep look at the data to see what worked and what didn't work before saying, you've got to walk the line. All right. This was Aaron O'Toole on election mm-hmm. night. I challenge the prime minister to put the unity of this country and the well-being of its people first. And I told him if he thinks he can threaten Canadians with another election in 18 months, the Conservative Party will be ready. Yeah. And whenever that day comes, I will be ready to lead Canada's Conservatives to victory. Thank you, Canada. Let's so get to I, I, you know, He made it a point in his concession speech. I'm not going anywhere. I, I am. We're ready. Um, but is he going to be around, I guess, is the, the, the bigger question right now. Susan Smith, what do you think? That's a really good question, Rob. I think, I mean, if you listen to Aaron O'Toole, uh, he was a pretty angry guy on election night. Half of his anger was directed at Trudeau. The other half was sort of channeled into feistiness, saying, I'm not going anywhere. And he said it several times, which is unusual for a leader to have to say to have to say that. So is he voluntarily walking a plank? No. Are there a bunch of people who are already pushing him and were before the end of the campaign onto a plank? Absolutely. Pierre Poliev, Michelle Rempel, Jenny Byrne, who's a longtime Harper strategist, um, Ronna Ambrose on election night was after uh, was after Aaron O'Toole. There are people from the Harper side of the party who will be very unhappy. And, and to your point at the, the opening about the positioning that Aaron O'Toole um, uh, took to try and broaden the tent. Look, as a as a liberal, uh, you know the, the biggest competition for liberals uh, back in the day were the the. the progressive conservatives. Um, it's much better when the conservatives aren't progressive uh, from a liberal perspective, as far as I'm concerned. But but Aaron O'Toole, you know, he's going to have to, the biggest fight he's got right now is within his party. He will be under significant attack, even when tempers cool. He didn't distance himself from Jason Kenney, who's an utter disaster. He, and as you mentioned, he botched the gun issue. He botched the vaccination issue. He He fumbled the women's right to choose issue. And when the going got tough, he ducked. 
if you're a leader and you want to be prime minister, you can't hide from hard questions. I mean, he canceled the CTV interview one-on-one right at the last minute. And he was going out the back door so he didn't have to take questions. That's not someone uh, who can lead the country in tough times. And, and I think people saw that. So he will be the embattled Aaron O'Toole for a while. In terms of other planks, I think the first person that will be voluntary, voluntarily perhaps walking the plank will be Annamie Paul. Yeah, well, I, uh, I don't blame her. I don't, her. I don't, I, I, I don't blame her. I don't blame yeah, her, actually. Yeah. Um, so we'll see leadership change there. Yeah. I think Jagmeet Singh will hold on to his. Mm-hmm. Aaron O'Toole definitely embattled, and I'm, you know, got my eyes peeled on Alberta. It's going to be fighting. All right, all right, all right. Before we get to, before we get to Alberta, before we get, did you have any response there, Gary? Did you want to rebut anything there? Or? Well, look, I think in, in, in some ways, I don't think I agree with everything Susan said about those people that that would have been uh, coming coming out of the woodwork on, on election night. But but the, the question is this for the Conservatives: they have to decide whether they want to enter this vicious cycle of wash, rinse repeat where they have a leader they get an election they might lose the election and they toss them out the next day uh, that does not breed stability that does not breed a path to government and if you think back you know jean chrétien uh people wanted to throw him out of the liberal party leadership uh leading up to 1993 um and he came back and he won uh you know a majority government in 1993 so uh, you know, and ninety-seven, two thousand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people can learn. People can grow. Um, this was his first campaign. I do agree with Susan that the biggest threat immediately, it won't be from outside. It'll be from inside the caucus. And the first thing he needs to do is unite the caucus behind his leadership. And that's what that old speech was all about on election night. Okay, I want to read a little bit from uh, a column from Don Martin of CTV News. On the future of Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, quote, a snowy walk toward retirement in late 2022 or early 2023 is in play. Even though he clearly wanted to cap his career with a majority win before heading off to pocket millions of consulting or speaking dollars in the private sector. And if he doesn't walk willingly, willingly, leader wannabes like Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland and former Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney will undoubtedly give him a gentle nudge down the plank, uh, a gentle push down the plank. Um, Susan, how likely is that scenario? Christian Freeland well, pushing Trudeau down the plank. <laughs> ah, I like the look of that. Actually. Uh, I Get thought uh, Christian Freeland campaigning very happily with uh, and, and, and heartily with Prime Minister Trudeau with Justin Trudeau during this campaign and every other campaign. Uh, uh, Trudeau has delivered the third win for Liberals. It's the third Conservative leader he's defeated. He defeated Harper, he defeated Scheer, and he defeated O'Toole. And he's just received a mandate from Canadians to lead the country out of the COVID pandemic. So he will, and and the economic recovery and, and build back better is what he said. Um, I think the Prime Minister um, uh, is seized with the agenda that's been put forward and the mandate that's been given to him by Canadians. And that's what he's focused on at the moment. Um, I can't predict where he'll be down the road, or, uh, but I think the road he's on right now, snow or no snow, is making sure Canadians uh, and the Canadian economy uh, comes back with force uh, following this pandemic. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you think of this scenario? You know, sometime next year, Trudeau takes his walk in the snow, and if he's not taking his walk in the snow, it will be strongly suggested by "quote unquote" leader wannabes that he take a walk in the snow. Uh, what do you think, know, Gary? Uh, I don't know if I actually agree with that scenario. Okay, you know, the Liberal Party is a little bit different than it, in its previous incarnations. You know, the Liberal Party for thirty years when, was engaged in these inter battles between Chrétien folks and Martin folks. And, and when Justin Trudeau took over the leadership of the Liberal Party, it was a very clear decision to separate the two sides uh, out, out, away from Trudeau's leadership. As such, the Liberal Party has become Justin Trudeau, and Justin Trudeau has become the Liberal Party. And as Susan points out, he's led them to three victories. A win is a win. We're not going to be in an election anytime soon. Uh, he doesn't I, I suggest, I don't know if he has a, a mandate, you know, losing a popular vote for the second time in a row and, 
uh, you know, uh, in, in some in some provinces, he, you know, won a plurality of seats, 26 percent of the vote. That's not exactly great success. But he did lead them to victory three times. And it's hard to give somebody a push out the door when they've done that, especially when he has, you know, basically created the Liberal Party in his and recreated it in his image. And so many of the key decision makers and players are tied to him personally. So I think it's ultimately up to him. It's, it's his okay. decision when he wants to go. Right. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see, if, you know, we'll see if that happens. OK, we'll be right back and we'll talk about the Kenny effect. <laughs> On the Rob Snow Show. Your political fix on City News. The opening our business in a, especially in a pandemic, in that kind of situation, is very challenging. First, uh, people don't know me. People don't know my product. To build a new clientele, to build a trust for them, to to show them that I care about it. I do love my food. Uh, that was the biggest challenge. And of course, in all lockdown, um, we were had to face it regards my employee, guests, ladies, what they work for me. I didn't want to tell them, sorry, I'm close. I'm not having a job for you. No, they have a families, they have a fam kids to feed. So this is very important because we are family orientated. And uh, we decided to open. We, of course, essential business. So uh, been very tough, very, very tough as we didn't see people on the road. Market was completely quiet, but we knew it that we have to wait and we knew it that we're going to be fine. In this town, we built an um, online shop, uh, Vedel Online. And uh, we did Uber, Uber Eats, which one is picking up and is very, um, very popular. We have a really good uh, feedback. So this is the um, uh, song for my heart. And uh, yeah, and we try to uh, expand. I thinking about opening another location. So uh, I want to make Vedel famous. I want to make the Vedel place to be for all the families with kids try the traditional food what their grandparents cooked in the countries when they from or even canadian people um, they're more than welcome to come and try our famous pierogies i try to be passionate about my food uh organic food food made with love with all homemade uh organic so uh you can find uh food from all over the europe polish german ukrainian romanian um, French, uh, Armenian, so all kind of different uh, types of food. Uh, homemade lunches, we focus on the homemade lunches, grandma style. Uh, I keep always saying, like in my Genya Babcha house, how she cooked, I wanted this love and this food over here because I believe that would bring all, uh, all people around me. And uh, yeah, all the organic cold cuts, uh, lovely selection of, uh, of uh, sausages, uh, cheeses, European cheeses, uh, great selections of mustard, uh, French uh, cookies, all where you need from Europe you can find here at the Vedel Touch of Europe. If you think good way, that's it. You have to, I had the option to cry in the corner and say, oh, pandemic is coming. No, you need to stand up and fight for it and be, have your eyes open, think outside of the box and, and, and do it. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Part two of your political fix here on the Rob Snow Show with Susan Smith from Blue Sky and Gary Kelly, uh, Gary Keller, pardon me, from Strategy Core. Uh, let's talk about the Kenny effect. The Kenny effect uh, sounds like a summer blockbuster. The Kenny <laughs> effect. Um, <laughs> it was a summer blockbuster. It's it's the fall that's causing all the problems. Um, but how damaging, Gary, to the conservative campaign. Uh, was the Kenny government's handling of the fourth wave, um, the big reversal, the apology, SOS, please send help. Um, why don't, let's start right there. How, yeah. did, you know, did, did that really do in the conservative campaign? Um, what do you think? So uh, until the, uh, the announcement from Premier Kenny on the Thursday before the election campaign, it obviously, you know, 
in the stories were, were brewing about the situation in Alberta, but it, until that point, I don't think it had any impact on any campaign. In terms of the national campaign, it, it where the impact was was twofold. One, I think it, it you know took the national campaign off message for a day and had to make them refocus on dealing with questions around uh, around Aaron O'Toole's uh, positions, his relationship with. Uh, Jason Kenney, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure, though, that it, it impacted voters outside of Alberta that greatly. Where it may have had an impact is actually in Alberta. I've heard on the doorstep that, you know, that, on, that candidates were hearing on the doorstep that they were getting questions in Alberta about Kenny and frustration with Kenny. <clears throat> it may have cost the seat in Calgary Skyview. Um, Edmonton Senate is still too close to call and will come down to mail-in ballots. Um, I don't think it necessarily cost the Edmonton Griesbaugh seat for the Conservatives. I think that was just uh, a hard work by the NDP to take that seat. Um, so uh, might have cost, you know, one or two seats in Alberta. It, it might have. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and there's also a bit of unfairness in this in, in that, you know, uh, you know, Jagme Singh was never asked to answer for John Horgan's uh, position on, on vaccines when uh, BC was going through inflated numbers on, uh, on uh, r- r- numbers that rose on COVID. So um, I'm not sure it, 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 it may have delayed the conservatives uh, the last few days on the campaign and, right, and right. face them. But uh, I don't know if it actually impacted many, many seats. Okay. What do you think, Susan? Uh, I think it showed, uh, well, the, I mean, the Kenny's been a disaster for a long time. Anybody looking on the outside, looking in at how Alberta has been handled, the Delta numbers going up, the absolute refusal to put in place the health measures that every other um, province and, you know, country has been putting in place and, and the desire to open up and declare the whole thing over just in time for Stampede for his photo op has really hurt the people of Alberta. And I, did, I do think it had an impact on the national campaign because Aaron O'Toole wouldn't distance himself from Jason Kenney because there was video of Aaron O'Toole saying what a great job um, Jason Kenney was doing in managing the COVID pandemic. So I do think that factored in, A, to people's impression of, of Jason Kenney, uh, Aaron O'Toole's judgment uh, when it comes to that. And, it, and, you know, coupled with the whole his whole position on mandatory vaccines for trains and planes and federal worker, federally regulated workers, it, it made Canadians even more uncertain about how uh, O'Toole would handle uh, the pandemic and getting out of it, uh, like the, for the final stretch. So definitely an impact. Um, in terms of Calgary, look, Calgary Skyview, George Shahal, I, I've got the numbers up here. He won, he had 43% of the vote. The Conservative yeah. candidate had 36% of the vote. Yeah. Uh, that might have helped. Yeah, it looks like they have a winner there. Uh, I was wa- I was watching the uh, Twitter video of the new uh, Calgary Skyview MP this morning uh, from the uh, from the. Oh no, they uh, had a winner from, on E-Night. With oh yeah, I, I know E-Night from the. Out, from, no. Have you not seen this video of the of, from the from the ring uh, camera that they have the, the the doorbell camera that they have of that guy from Calgary oh, Skyview. Oh no, I'll have to look yeah, at that. Yeah, he, he, he's been an MP for a day and he's already got. And he's already in trouble. He's already in trouble. He's like sneaking onto somebody's porch and stealing something from the mailbox, stealing a fly from the mailbox. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know about that. Already I know that George Hall was a, a well-celebrated, a well-respected uh, Calgary City Councillor. Right. He's now going to be a well-respected Calgary MP. I expect to see his face in Cabinet uh, as well. Oh, in for, um, Okay. For All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I okay. do. I do. I, right. I, I mean... If you remember the narrative out of the 2019 campaign, it was... Keep him out of the mailroom. That's all I'll say. Okay. uh, (laughs) Listen, I want to ask you, seriously, um, Jason Kenney, I don't know what... uh, My gosh. Uh, He left Ottawa. He went out to Alberta. He... I, I mean, he had to basically burn the village down to rebuild it. You know, I mean, it was it was uh, really quite an accomplishment what he did. You know, it basically blew up the old Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta, uh, created a whole new political entity, entity, ran for the leadership, <laughs> won it, ran for uh, in the general election, won that, and I mean, here we are. It's not that much. It, um, it, it, not a lot of time has passed, and the, you talk about knives being out. I mean, he's getting yeah. it from all sides. I mean, yeah. people who are at longtime allies with him through that whole journey say he needs to go. He needs to mm-hmm. go. Now, I don't know if he's going to go. Uh, the election, he has a lot of runway yet. March of 20, March, 
between March 1st and May 31st of 2023 is what David tells me is when they're going to have Correct. the Alberta election. So, but there's a leadership you know, review before that, okay. a mandatory so, leadership review before that. Right. Um, does, he does he survive? Does he survive? I guess. I don't know. I don't think so. One of the things that happened last week is there was a two hour caucus meeting scheduled and it went five. And the story is that there were, you know, a very long lineup of speakers saying why uh, they didn't, they had no longer had confidence in the leader. And there's another caucus meeting today. And um, if they if they don't succeed in pushing him out, one of the things I think they will do is seek to advance that leadership, that mandatory leadership review. So right now, the way it stands, he has until sometime in 2022 for the party to review his leadership. But this movement, this chunk within caucus, who's really unhappy at how he's handled the pandemic, and it's split, right? It's the people who say, don't make us wear masks and don't make us get vaccinated and don't make us have a vaccine passport, versus the others who say, come on, we got to be practical here and do what's in the best interest of Canadians. There's a big split in caucus, but the, the bottom line is they no longer have confidence in the premier. And he is in serious, serious trouble. Yeah, I, I, I just the I, I want, I, let's hear from Gary. I, want, I just want to know: Can he ride it out, given well, the well, amount look, of time Jason until Kenny, the next election? So, Jason Kenney is a fighter, as you said. The, the work that he did to unite the factions within the conservative movement in Alberta, uh, there's very few people that could have done that and put the work in to do that. And so, you know, Jason Kenney isn't just somebody that's going to walk away from from a tough job. But Susan is right in the fact that there are two factions both unhappy within the party. Yesterday's cabinet shuffle of Health Minister Tyler Shandro out was an attempt to placate caucus in some way. Um, we'll see what happens in today's meeting. I suspect uh, there will be some live tweeting from people uh, or uh, leaks within the, the caucus meeting. Um, and, uh, the, you know, will he be able to unite the factions under his leadership uh, going forward? Um, it, it'll be a tough day for him. Uh, but if anybody can do it, it's Jason Kenney, because he ultimately was the one who united the factions, brought everybody to the promised land, won a majority government, defeated the NDP. Um, but uh, but yeah, he has a huge task on his hands, and uh, we'll see if he's up to the task. All right. Hey, thank you so much for the discussion this week. It's great to hear from both of you. I'm glad that you both had to... I had a chance to get a nap after election day. <laughs> and we'll see what the rest of the week Thanks, brings. Uh, Coffee transfusion. Very, very busy. Thing. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Susan Smith, Principal, Blue Sky Strategy Group. Gary Keller, Vice President of Strategy Core. And the Talk Back Hour is coming up. We're going uh, deep into local issues this morning. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV Viewer Response Line.